Fantastic. All right. So good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for another webinar. This is our July 2020 webinar. And this morning, we are very fortunate that we have um, one of TVDM's close friends, Ruth Grunder from Pam Golding Property Management Services. She's the operations manager and bees knees um, as a portfolio manager at uh, Pam Golding. That is Nicole in our previous uh, place of employment when we were uh, managing agents that taught us everything that we know. So Ruth, we're very, very excited to have you talk to us today. Um, I know that Ruth has got a little bit of news, but yes, in order to do yeah. this, whoopsie, let's mute ourselves with this background noise in order to do this type of thing. You have to have a little bit of nerves, either for excitement uh, or a little bit of uh, a little bit of fear. It keeps you going, adrenaline going, and the day that you are 100% comfortable is the day to no longer do what we're doing. So we're very <laughs> excited about the topic. The topic, I think, is a very relevant one. It's all about uh, taking minutes in annual general meetings, special general meetings, and trustee meetings, and then, of course, all the practicalities and other important stuff when it comes to meetings. Meetings. This is not only aimed at managing agents, this is aimed as well at uh, trustees and self-administered schemes. And I'm sure a lot of what you're talking about, Ruth, is based on the common law of meetings, which is relevant to homeowners associations and other types of community schemes as well. So before we hand over to our colleague Ruth, we are going to um, deal with a couple of administrative issues. So Kyle, over to you. So Linda, good morning, everyone. Um, please sign up to our newsletter if you haven't already to get more information about our webinars and blogs. Um, also, this webinar will be recorded and put on our website and on YouTube. Um, and then also we're very excited to announce our exclusive use um, area series coming out. Um, more information will be released on our social medias. So please have a look out for that. And it's going to be on the 10th, 17th and 24th of August. Cool, thank you. Fantastic, all right. Now, without further ado, we're going to hand over to Ruth and Ruth has got a very nice presentation that she's prepared for you. Ruth, like me, is not the strongest when it comes to IT. That's why we've got people that in our teams that work with this type of thing. Uh, but Ruth very kindly prepared, I think it's a 100 page document, Ruth, yeah. or a little bit short not, not that bad. <laughs> Uh, a very nice PDF document uh, that I went through yesterday evening and was very, very excited for this morning. That is going to be made available on our website afterwards. So please don't stress if you're not writing fast enough or copying down anything fast enough. It is all going to be recorded and shared with you. And then, of course, the actual PDF will be shared as well. So, Ruth, over to you. You can share your screen or not share your screen. And yeah, share screen. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Uh, this is going to be an interesting ride. Yeah, as I say, um, the slides and I didn't work, so it's a good old-fashioned PDF document. So as, as Linda says, it will be shared. Um, so yeah, minutes taking, you know, or tip meetings are when hours are wasted and minutes are taken. Um, and the minutes sometimes take longer to prepare than the meeting actually, you know. Took. So it's always a, it's a challenge, it's an ongoing battle for property managers. Um, it's one of the great joys of our lives, but they have to be done. So I did a little bit of uh, work on it and I, I anything I present obviously are my opinions and I have lots of them. So if you've got a different opinion, please shout. It's always interesting to interact with people. So basically to minute or not to minute and other practical issues is what I've tried to portray here. I, I got a very, found a very interesting article a couple of years back in the um, CSSA best practice guide on minuting minutes, it was in March 2018. It was really interesting. They did a survey with a whole bunch of people and came up with a whole lot of answers, which was, was very interesting. Um, so although, although it's more company related, it certainly um, is uh, valid for us as well. So, you know, minutes are minutes and the way they done is really important. And they sort of, they've come up with the, the, the few things I'm gonna just point out in the beginning is what they came up with as a result of their survey, which just made perfect sense. Um, so basically the purpose of minutes is to provide, a provide an accurate record of the decisions made, to record the resolutions passed and actions decided on at the minute, provide sufficient context. Um, so not reams and reams, but sufficient context on key, key discussion points and to demonstrate that the directors discharge their duty of care, skill and diligence to enjoy the protection of the business judgment rule. And, and the CSOS Act and the um, SDSMA and rules also uh, uh, refer to applying your mind and due diligence and all that good stuff. 
um, to provide a recording of dissenting views, not everybody's views, and provide evidence that the directors meet their statutory and regulatory duties, as well as responsibilities that they're supposed to, to, to do, perform, and provide a sufficient context so that the person reading the minutes can understand the key discussion points. They don't need a book, they just need to understand the key points of the matter and how the conclusion arrived at, how the resolution was taken at the end of the day. Um, with, with drafting minutes, um, they need to be written in a way that someone who is not present can understand it. It's also important to remember that it, it is a formal and permanent record that's created that will form part of the company memory, body corporate memory, but it, it, you know, minute books are one thing that you can't ever throw away because you need that history. Um, they have to be accurate and they must give a balanced and impartial and objective recording of the meeting. So it's not your opinion as a minute taker, it's, it's the, what happened as, as a whole. The, um, it's, the accuracy shouldn't be underestimated because, it, as I say, they became the, become definitive evidence and it could also end up in court or with us in CSOS. Who said what is not the point, it is how was the decision arrived at? Why was the resolution taken? So you need the gist of that. Um, so it has to meet the legal requirements, but easy, equally easy to understand. So with us, our biggest thing is raising levies. So is the resolution correct? Is it valid? Does it prove the levies were raised? That interest may be charged. It has to be there. Um, and then I just give a brief terminology and sentences yet a full recording. So that's not, I don't know, this whatever you call it, geek speak, whatever it is that you use on WhatsApps and SMSs, it's not that. It's genuine English that everyone can understand. Um, board meetings are taken or board decisions are taken as a whole. Individuals do not need to be named unless it's a dissenting view, because then you might need to note that or a strenuous objection. But at the end of the day, it, it's run by majority. Um, and their inclusions must be recorded in relation to their presence at the meeting, apologies, conflicts declared, and where they are linked to action items. Not who said who, about what, um, no. It's, it's to, to get to the decisions that's important. And obviously I am X and I was at the meeting in my capacity as trustee, chairman, or some a, a, a visitor. Then the level of detail, again, it's, it's not too long or too short. And this is all, as I say, from the summary, uh, not too long or too short, not a verbatim recording. The key points must be uh, shown. Decision must be clearly minuted. It was resolved that. Then it, it is a decision and it's the same as in sectional title. It was resolved that. The trustees resolved to raise the levies. The trustees did this. The trustees resolved that. That is what it is. Key decisions and decision items, not individuals. I know a lot of people love to have their names in the minutes. It's really not relevant. Um, the minutes was awarded to demonstrate the reasons for the decision, um, to be given the, the protection of the um, business judgment rule, and that you will find in the Companies Act that they took reasonably diligent steps to become informed about the matter, that they had no personal financial inter uh, interest in the matter, that they followed procedure, then they made or supported the decision and had a rational basis for, for believing the decision to be in the best interest of the company and of the body corporate in our case, not because that particular trustee likes purple spots with pink ribbons. No, what's best for the company is perhaps it actually has to just be plain gray. So they, they need to make, it's not a personal decision, it's for the best. There must be some background information and not who said what. The, the draft button, when it's, uh, they should be, if they're well written, and then if, you, if you've left it too late, they're never going to be well written. They must be well written that they don't need editing. There's nothing worse than sending out a set of buttons that come back with track, track, track lines saying change this, change that. Um, obviously, the biggest influence is your chairman, but he, at the end of the day, they, the, the minutes must be acceptable to all the trustees. Uh, amendments around style and contact are, content are acceptable, provided the key points of the discussion and the decisions or recommendations are recorded. Um, it's ex acceptable to allow an executive who has made a technical presentation to the board uh, to comment on the minute relating to that portion. So often you have somebody that comes to explain something to the trustees, then just get them to check that, that you've recorded it correctly. Um, and in no circumstances should a director or anyone else be permitted to insert points not made at the meeting or to delete those that were. Once the minutes have been approved by the board, they should not be amended. 
If an error is discovered at a later date, the, should, uh, the error should be agreed and minuted at a subsequent meeting and reference to this, uh, to this must amendment can be made on the original minutes. Now, I must say I'm, I'm extremely precious about my minutes. Uh, I, um, I don't, I don't um, like people making changes to my minutes. So, I, you know, you send your minutes out in time, seven days, as they respect that, that, that they're supposed to be sent out, then you will have them right, because you'll remember it, it's fresh in the mind, you send it out, it then gets circulated to all owners. And at the next year, AGM, a year later, somebody comes back to you and says, I corner, that's wrong. I, I don't, I don't agree with that. So what I do is I will minute it in those minutes at the current AGM that so-and-so didn't like, or there was a comment that this was maybe not correct. But those minutes were done a year ago, I don't believe a year later you must now uh, make changes to something that was circulated when nobody made a comment at the time. So I say do it immediately, do it as soon as possible, triple check them before you send them out. Um, then the minutes are obviously being assigned by the trustees and they become um, uh, evidence of the proceeding of the meeting. Um, the usual practice is to approve the meeting at the put the approval of the minutes of the previous meeting on the agenda of the subsequent meeting. So that's when they get approved in our circumstances. Um, and it must just be done. Once it's done, it's signed, you put it in the in the minute book, job done, I throw away all my notes. Um, so the I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Just a, a quick question from my side. When it comes to um, the comments on the minutes, very often at a meeting, I say to people when we deal with the approval of the minutes, um, I want proposers and I want comments from people that were actually in attendance at the meeting. Have you ever dealt with a situation where somebody that was not in attendance at that previous AGM or special general meeting wants to make comments on the minutes? And what is your view on that? <laughs> that would be, it happens fairly regularly, but I, I, I'm, I'm very, I really do not change my minutes. I send them out in good faith based on what was happened at the meeting, and they then go out to all owners within the seven-day period. If nobody has come back to you at that time to say, I think you've made a mistake or something like that, you can't tell me a year down the line. I will, as I say, then note it in the current set that, that a comment was made and whatever the comment was. And then it's people can read it for what it is. Okay. And then I've got a question from Paul. I know that you said you wanted to make this interactive, which is why I'm interrupting you with comments and questions now. He asked, do voice recordings of the meetings classify as records and then saved for a period of five years as per the, uh, the PPA? Well, I think, uh, Paul, I mean, you're the expert here, but it's also the uh, poppy. Um, well, now minutes have to be have to be kept on record for perpetuity and not necessarily only for five years but what do you think about voice recordings or does it have to be capable of being put into writing or do you is your preference that it'd rather be put into writing immediately i know your next part is going to be about the recordings and we've got a whole host of questions about that too what is your view on voice recordings I, I don't think recordings, I think they're a tool to get the minutes right. And once the minutes are done, I discard them. I don't share. It's, it's not right. Nobody, it's not, especially with Poppy now, you don't have a meeting to have all yourself flaunted all over the world on recordings and Zoom meet and all that nonsense. No. I, once I've done the minutes, I discard that. I throw it away. It's not for the minute books or what have to be kept for, for life. That's fine. Um, so once my notes are done and the uh, my notes... I throw my notes away when the minutes are approved. So if it's for the AGM, then my notes will hang around for a year. At the next AGM that's approved, then I throw those notes away. Um, the minutes get kept, the minutes are approved, that's the record for the, for the meeting. That's I, want correct, I want to correct myself quickly. Nicole very quickly reminded me, and this is this, I had like a, a, a moment when we looked through the act. I think we spent a good hour reading through the act, left, right, and center, upside and down, whatever, uh, to actually see whether or not this perpetuity thing was taken from the Sectional Titles Act to the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act. And apparently it's not. It's not in the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act. We always do still say keep minutes and records in perpetuity, but it actually doesn't say that anymore. That was a real shocker for us. I was like, no, it's there. It's in that provision there somewhere. And then we couldn't find it. 
we do okay. also add it to our management rules to make yeah. sure that it is done in good practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it should be. It's, it's, it's the only history you've got of the scheme. If you have a change of, of, of trustees, how are they going to go back? Or anyone for that matter, how, how are you going to go back? No, not necessarily that you were running it 10 years ago, but you go and, I mean, when you take on a new scheme, the best thing to do, in my opinion, is to read the minute books. It gives you a perfectly good picture of what you're getting your feet into. Exactly, exactly. But, all right. Um, yeah, as I say, I delete my recordings once I've done the minutes, and then um, I, I say it my notes until those minutes are actually approved. Okay. And then um, who must prepare the minutes? Well, obviously, the, the act is the body. Okay, so I've, those above points, just for the records, was from that uh, article that I told you about. Now we're dealing with what the STSMA says, and I have put uh, all the references. Um, as I say here, these are my opinions. Um, so, so basically, the body corporate must prepare and update minutes of general meetings and trustees meetings, which obviously means the managing agent actually does it. Should the trustees hold a meeting when they don't invite the managing agent, well, obviously, then it would be the responsibility of the respective trustees to do that. Then the act, well, the rules also say that you must include the following information, the date, the time, the place, the names and role of the person's people's present, including details of authorization of proxies or other representatives, if, obviously if it's an AGM, remember a trustee meeting, you can't hold a proxy for that, you're either there or you're not there, um, and the text of all resolutions and the results of the voting and all motions. The outcome of each vote, so if you're at the AGM, the outcome of each vote, uh, vote including the number of votes for and against, must be announced at the chair, by the chairperson at the meeting and recorded in the minutes. So that's that's it's it's very important. Again, it's your it's your history. I'm, I personally, if you're not using meeting trial, I don't know how the chairman can give the results. I haven't found a system that works better than meeting trial. So yes, maybe I'm biased, but it certainly works. Uh, with the advent of virtual meetings and the no, new normal now of hybrid meetings, it is imperative that the meeting trial or similar platform, obviously. But I found meeting trial because it's worked for me. I tried another one; it didn't work too well. Um, so to make you sure that you do comply with the rule 28 and you must announce the votes immediately at the meeting and not the next day or seven days later in the minutes. Ruth, just on that point, um, what happens if you are not using a platform like Meeting Pal, for example, though? Really, guys, who's not using it at this point in time? And no, Ruth and I do not get any type of commissional kickback on it. We just go to meetings where this works for us. Um, what happens if a platform like that is not being used and um, the, 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 it's just impossible to have the outcome of the votes announced? You know, would it be in practice something that is uh, that is done where the votes are given in an interim basis and then perhaps checked at the office the next day quickly and announced? Mm -hmm. Bearing in mind that we do go to meetings quite often when the vote is announced at the meeting in haste. And then afterwards, it turns out that the calculator wasn't working that great and, and there's actually a different outcome. So what is your, your view from a legal perspective and then from a practical perspective? Well, that'd be the catch. The legal perspective is right there, it tells you. Oh, there's no argument there. So that's beside the point. The practical is, is a challenge. I have to admit that. And I mean, I've had it where you've got a scheme where it's basically an old age home, there's 20 odd people, and they just, we, no matter how hard you try. Um, so then we go, obviously, go back to the famous voting slips. And what I try and do to give results, I ask if anyone's going to vote no, then at least I can say, okay, there's one vote no, we'll tally it at the end of the meeting. But even that uh, uh, is a challenge, which is why I'm so happy to have this new technology. I literally was at a meeting, we went round the table, yes, 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 yes. Everyone said yes, we get back to the office, we draft the minutes, and lo and behold, on those little pieces of paper that they've signed, there are no's. So it's a challenge, and it, it is a challenge. And if you've got a, 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 a big scheme, I don't know, you adjourn the meeting, and you do the tally and then you give the results and then you close the meeting. But it can take hours because then, you're, you know, if you're doing it to do that, your meeting hasn't closed so you can still give the results at the, before the end of the meeting. It's not the best way to go, but, you know, you've got to do what you've got to do to get the results out there. Um, it is a challenge. And that's why our technology is so great. And, and, and especially with the hybrid meetings. And if you, if you now, as you can now have sort of physical meetings, uh, again, you can also assist people to get onto whatever system it is that you're using and, and, and help them get onto it. And I am finding that I'm getting more and more take up on it. A lot of people were very averse of it to start with, what is this nonsense? What are you making me do? We don't want to do it. 
Um, but slowly, slowly, uh, you get, you're getting it right, and it certainly makes life a lot easier, um, and you have your results. So, yeah, it's a challenge. <laughs> and if the, votes, if the voting outcome is challenged, what is the, the process there? You've got backup because it's recorded. So you download um, the information from uh, the meeting file app, and, and you've got it all there. There's no misunderstanding. And if somebody is really challenged, you can put it on manual. So then you, the, that person, you'll ask that person, they say, I can't do it, whatever. And then th throughout the meeting, as you go along, you say to him, are you voting yes? Are you voting no? And you click it. And, and you can actually display your, the app on the big screen so people can see exactly how the votes are coming in. If there is a manual vote that you vote as per the person's request. It's, 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 it's all there. You, you, I think it would be very difficult to argue it. Perfect, thank you. Okay. Then um, the minutes uh, must record the results of all the items on the agenda that are voted on. As I said, meeting pal does uh, provide it. It's not a, a, a debate and account of the meeting. We've already been there. Just trustees by a majority vote. Therefore, the majority of, uh, of trustees agree to the resolution is successful. At the AGM and general uh, meetings, Resolutions are decided by members by majority vote in PQ values, unless obviously there's a special resolution on the agenda. So who's entitled to general uh, notice of a general meeting? Obviously the members, the registered bondholders, holders of future, right develop, uh, future development rights in terms of section 25 and the managing agents. So you are entitled to notice. Who's entitled to a trustee meeting? Obviously all the trustees. Um, if they're not, if they're absent from the Republic, you don't have to give them notice. Well, with the advent of with email and Zoom meetings now, it's a moot point, so they get their notice. Um, they, oh yeah, well, as it says there. Then also a, a member can get, get a notice for a trustee meeting, a registered uh, a mortgagee can get a, a notice, as can the holder of a future development right, but they have to have requested that in writing. Then Every notice that goes out must be sent to those parties that have requested it. Um, and sometimes I don't know, but at some of our AGMs, I found that under directions, the members state then the direction to the trustee is that notice must be sent to all members of every trustee meeting. So then if that is the case, then it must go out. So, so those are the four people that can get must get notices. Ruth, in your experience, and it's not trustee meetings, but uh, annual general meetings and special general meetings, do body corporates tend to give notice uh, to the registered bondholders? Because I can honestly, with hand on heart, say that I've never done it. Uh, we have. And the joke is that they come bounce back and say, what is this for? <laughs> <laughs> the correct details is a joke. And if the transfer comes through and there's a note on there, then we can load that email. Wonderful. But that's not always the case. Uh, um, we have all the major contact details for all the major banks, but it either bounces back or someone will come and say, what's that for? Hey, we did it. <laughs> uh, it really is a challenge. Um, okay, so where were we? Who's done notice? And then attendance by telephone or other method. I do like the telephone, but in the new act. I mean, really, have we not a bit archaic? Anyone try to hold a conference call on a telephone? Good luck to you tonight. Very difficult, yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, the trustees or the body corporate can make arrangements for that for a trustee meeting, an annual general meeting, or a special general meeting. Obviously, by now, we have Zoom, which is absolutely wonderful, so there's no problem. Um, it, it provided that the method is access accessible to all trustees or other persons entitled, that people participating can communicate with each other during the meeting, and uh, that it allows the chairman to confirm with reasonable certainty that the identity of the participants. And the person who obviously attends in this method is considered present in person at the meeting. Now, it's, it's, it's a difficult one because people come on as iPad 5 or iPad 6 or some other weird name they've got for it. You need to ask the person who identify themselves and then you can actually change the name on the Zoom so that when I always take a snip of the attend the Zoom participant, oh, no. I take a snip oh, of that no. and that is what I put on I'm my Zoom. It's like a double check of this me. Yes, Sorry, sorry. sorry. There we go. Okay. Um, so I, I, I believe you can't refuse a member access to a meeting by not allowing members to attend virtually. I just, I don't believe you can do that anymore. The solution is there and it works and it must be used. Physical meetings are fading away. Virtual or hybrid meetings are here to stay. 
you, you can't go backwards now. We, we've kind of it's changed all of that, in my opinion. And now you can't suddenly get snotty and say, oh, no, we're not doing it virtually. I do not believe you can do that. Um, it, it's far less time consuming. I mean, if you hold your meetings on Zoom, you don't have to pack your bags, get in your car and go to the meeting. You just sit in your office and you run with it. Um, and also more likely to get a quorum because people are coming to meetings. I've met people that I've never seen since I don't know when. They're coming to meetings. They're all overseas and they're at meetings because it's so easy to do. And we just find, depending on, especially trustee meetings, you set the time so that it's convenient for people wherever they are in the world. So they must be identifiable. And as I say, once you know who it is, and be careful of locking people out because then they can't get back in, as I discovered to my horror. We asked, we asked, we asked, and um, the person behind the name this didn't answer. So that, the trustee said, okay, just lock them out. I should have actually just put them in the waiting room or something. Um, yeah. Because you can't get them back in if you've tossed them out. Zoom so won't allow it. So that was a bit of an embarrassment. So on that, yeah. note, on that note about participation, I've been to quite a few meetings where on Zoom um, they do a webinar as opposed to a meeting like we're doing now. And then in order for people to speak, they have to get promoted to be a panelist um, or they need to be unmuted or they must use the chat function. And sometimes the chat function is uh, not um, uh, enabled. Uh, so basically you just, you just sit there and you raise your hand, but you only get acknowledged and made a panelist you know, at the mercy of the person that is hosting the meeting. And sometimes yes and sometimes no. What is your view on, on that? No, it's very clear that everybody participating must be able to communicate with each other. So yes, from a, a courtesy point of view, you ask people to mute. When they want to speak, they put up their hands and they talk. Um, but they have to be able to communicate with each other. Yes, you can control it because you, you can't have all the background noise, but you certainly can't not allow somebody to communicate. Um, if somebody gets too rowdy or becomes totally whatever, you can put them in a side room and deal with it. But at the end of the day, they have to be able to communicate with each other as, as well as with the chairman. I don't think you can um, sit there and take, just... Take them to the back room and sort them out and then let them back Yeah, it's, just, it's very seldom happens. But the, my biggest issue with Zoom sometimes is people forget to go back onto mute and then it's chaos for everybody. That's... The, I've never had um, had any other issues at a meeting other than, as I say, oopsie down when um, somebody couldn't identify who they were and, and locked them out. And that was my mistake. I've learned. <laughs> it's happened. Um, attendees at trustees meetings that are other than trustees. Uh, so obviously the, the attendee, other trust people are members of the body corporate. The, those four people there that we discussed, they can speak on any matter on the agenda. They can't propose any motion. They're not allowed to um, vote. And they can't attend parts of the meeting that the trustees believe they shouldn't attend. If there's discussions of contraventions of the act or rules or any other matters in respect of which the trustees um, believe it would, would, not, would un, in, unreasonably interfere with interests of body corporate or other people's privacies. So yes, you can attend a trustees meeting if you're one of those four, but with the parameters. Um, at general meetings, uh, is, there are also uh, limitations imposed on attendees at a general meeting. So the attendees can obviously be a member who's allowed there any which way, uh, a registered walk D and the holder of a future development right. So they can be there, they can speak on the matter of the agenda, they can't propose a motion, they're not allowed to, uh, and they're not allowed, entitled to vote. Obviously the member is or his valid proxy. Um, and again, not allowed to attend any part of the general meeting and members resolve that their presence would interfere with the interests of the body corporate or privacy. <clears throat> so my favorite, an attorney is not allowed to attend a meeting with a member. If said attorney wishes to attend the meeting, he must hold a valid proxy. So I know they come with a strong arm attorney to batten, batten down your, 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 you know, bat, beat you about the head. Uh, no, they can't attend unless they have a proxy. <laughs> then only one of them can beat you over the head, the member or the proxy, not both. Uh, it's a challenge, I know, because these people come in looking for trouble or looking for a fight. But yeah, it's, that, that's sometimes quite difficult. <laughs> it has its moments. <laughs> um, how is notice given for trustees meeting? They can call a, a, a meeting by giving all the other uh, trustees not less than seven written days notice of the time, the place, and the setting up the agenda for the, uh, for the meeting. 
So again, if, if you've got people that have asked for notice, then they are part of that, they must be sent. So if, if all members of the body corporate must receive notice, then that must go out or your, uh, whoever else has asked. In cases of emergence, uh, urgency, a trustee can give a, a shorter notice as if, as if it's reasonable. And the trustees can also by written resolution set dates and a standard agenda for future meetings and deliver a copy of this resolution is then noted. So we often have, or some of us, our older schemes, they have a meeting on the last Wednesday of the month. That, that's been like that for the last 10 years. That's then everybody knows. Um, but we still send out a notice with the agenda and any other bits and bobs. Ruth, we very often get asked how often should trustees meet? And I always say that the trustees don't have to meet or the trustees can just have one meeting and that's the quick meeting after the annual general meeting while they're all in the same place for the election of the chairperson and the signing of the resolutions. But I mean, you don't even have to have that meeting. Uh, on an average, um, you know, is it monthly? Is it quarterly? Is it never? It's, it's actually, it's, it's so interesting. I, what I say, especially if we take on new buildings or if there's a building that's battling a bit, I suggest you have a meeting once a month. I know, don't shoot me, but I just believe once a month to get the scheme on track for whatever reason that's either off track or you've just taken it over or whatever the reasons are. I think once a month, once that gets up and running and things are, are, are running fine, you go down to, two, to every second month and then down to every quarter or whatever. I, then on the other hand, I have older schemes that literally everything is on email. You send out resolutions for them to sign, the job gets done, and the next time you see them is after the AGM. And I believe that the, that first trustees meeting is absolutely vital and you have the AGM and you immediately have that trustee meeting um, and that job done. And plenty of schemes then don't meet again, but they do it all on email. I have schemes that meet monthly, I have schemes that meet quarterly. So it, it, it really depends on, on the body corporate and the trustees involved and how busy they are. Okay. Yeah. Um, then yeah, I believe the, the, the best agenda is the simplest agenda, not with 200 agenda items because you never get to the half of them. Or they're repetitive. So sometimes the chairman says, I want this on the agenda, and then other couple of trustees come along, they say, I want this on the agenda. You end up with this whole list of stuff. A lot of it's repeated. Then you try and summarize it so you can make the agenda look a bit res uh, respectable. And they say, oh, well, you didn't put nothing on the agenda. Uh, yeah, it's how you read English. But I just believe in the Christopher principle, keep it simple. And then obviously the minutes must then follow the agenda items and record the agreements reached. Uh, and they slot things in, then you then you you can number it accordingly. But but you should run it. So I, I have a like a simple a simple standard agenda is is literally these eight items. And then under finance, you can have four point one arrear levies, four point two your actual to budget, four point three your new proposed budget if it's that time of the year, four point four is your levy uh, increase if it's if it's that time of the year and then again for maintenance maintenance and then what what comes up a new pool pump 5.1 the back gate needs to be replaced 5.2 so i just i just try and keep it simple and then under other business you bring up all the whatever else is is necessary and then the minutes must flow that same way so there is like the minutes of that meeting would be the same you will have all the items listed in the order in which they, they come up. And again, sometimes trying to, it's like herding headless chickens to try and stick to your agenda so that you do go through it one, two, three in a logical way. Because if you jump around, your minutes are going to be a nightmare and you, I don't think you actually get things accomplished. Uh, I believe stick to the agenda, that's what it's for. You get the job done and you move along swiftly. As I say, I've got lots of opinions. Guys, you're welcome to, to give me <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I attended a meeting for you back in the day, that one day that you were ill or something like that. I can't remember what it was. And I remember that the trustees was one of those buildings that sort of like wanted a monthly meeting, even though it wasn't necessary. And um, they, they didn't even look at the agenda that you prepared. They simply went through the minutes of the previous meeting and it was a regurgitation. I was like slitting my wrists, you know, having to think this minutes is basically going to be exactly the same as last month. You guys haven't even achieved anything. What was the purpose of meeting? Um, so I can imagine, I don't know if that body corporate's still doing that. No. <laughs> Probably, no. <laughs> Good. You can try them sometimes. We've got a couple of uh, questions, if we don't mind just taking one or two, because I know that you've got quite a lot that you want to share. Um, so I'm just going to squiz up to the top again and have a look at some of these questions that have come in. I'm so sorry. Okay, so we've done the voice recordings question. There was a question that somebody asked on the Facebook group this morning, if we could kindly ask, 
and it is um, the decision, the question is re regarding decisions and discussions, which had decisions made, but is not recorded in the minutes. Um, so in other words, you know, what happens when there are decisions that are made at a meeting, but they're not minuted, um, the validity of those decisions. And then the second question on that thread, what about rude comments that are made uh, in trustee meetings, which have damaging effects to the body corporate, should it be noted in the minutes or not? not rude comments i don't know what's the point as i say in my opinion minutes are not a he said she said we did we didn't No, it's, it's to get the gist of what was discussed and how the decision was arrived and if a decision was not minuted well that minute taker should be shocked um and then you have every the trustees or the chairman whoever has every right to correct the minutes if a decision was made it must be minuted otherwise how do you go forward um yeah. You can't. I mean, just say that they resolve to raise the levies and it's not minuted and there's no resolution. You can't raise the levies. You can't go to court to claim your rear levy. So it, it, it is really important that those things are noted and minuted. And yes, mistakes happen. But if you have three or four different people reading those minutes, somebody surely would have picked that up and said, hey, please put these in the minutes. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, we yes, all do make mistakes. Here's a good one. If we do not receive feedback from the trustees, can we still send the minutes to all the owners? We struggle to get feedback from the trustees. I feel a property manager. Um, yeah, that's a running thing. So if, if, if there is a, um, a, a direction at the AGM or wherever you've got that direction for, um, the caveat is minutes must be sent out in seven days. So you send them out in seven days, say to the trustees, I'm giving you until tomorrow close of business to, to have any comments and then send it out. They are only draft minutes until they are approved. So if they do have to, if you do have to change them or whatever, then you can send them out again and say, here's the final version. But you can't look like a chop because you're not getting feedback. Uh, we know the trustees are unpaid slaves, so I do understand sometimes that you don't get feedback. I mean, we all sit in that position, but you have to do what you've been asked to do. So if your instruction is to send it to all members, that's what you have to do. So send them, put a draft watermark on it, do whatever you have to do, but get them out. You don't look like, you don't look like a chop to the other 40 people. Yeah. Um, Oh dear. And one last question, and then we'll get back to you again. If a trustee request, if a trustee requests uh, that the meeting be recorded, can they ask the managing agent to send it to them? And I know this is a bit of an issue with, you know, yeah. what, what, who owns the recording or the platform that the recording is made on? Do you keep it? Do you delete it? And all those fun things. So, what is your view when it comes to that? I, honestly, I, I don't want to share them. I, I, I will find any excuse in the book to to not share those recordings. I just don't think it's right. It's not what you're going to meetings for. They are used, they are twisted. No, I, I honestly, then I'd rather not record. And in fact, I've actually stopped recording a lot of stuff because it's just not worth it. Your minutes always work, your, your notes always worked in the past before technology. They can work in the future. Um, I just, people are litigious. They, they misconstrue things. And especially if you've got a, a, a challenging scheme, then just don't record it, quite frankly, because ooh, it, can, and it, it makes trouble. And the problem is that people that weren't at the meeting get hold of them, and then it gets even more twisted. So I, I, I'm very loath with sharing stuff. Perfect. All right. Back to you. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So then how is notice given? At least 14 days of a general meeting, and it must state the, the place, the date, and the time. Uh, it can be called in seven days notice if it's short news is really necessary due to the urgency. Um, and then obviously you've got to explain why you're doing that. But the trustees may not call for shorter notice if there is a, a, a special uh, resolution with regard to improvements on the common property that are reasonably necessary. And if you are adopting a special resolution with regard to installing prepaid water meters. So remember with prepaid water meters, you actually have to give 60 days notice. So the, there's no way that you can even say that it's urgent for those two items. So if you're going to put in a new swimming pool into your um, building and you need a special resolution because it's reasonably necessary, you have to give your 30 days notice, finished and clear. And if you are going to put in prepaid meters, you actually have to give 60 days notice. Um, the, it may be called on less than 14 days notice, 
if it is in, agreed to in writing by all people entitled to attend. Well, uh, how, I don't think we'll ever get that right. So that's not even worth noticing, in my opinion. Um, and then the notice must obviously be accompanied was go out with at least the agenda, a copy of the comprehensive summary of the document to be discovered and approved, discussed and approved, and a, a proxy appointment form, obviously, if members can't attend. Um, the general meeting must be held in the local uh, municipal area. I'm sure everyone knows that. Uh, notice of a general meeting. Oh, this is where the Linda and I differ. <laughs> uh, notice of a general meeting must be delivered to members at their service addresses in terms of Rule 4.5, and other people can receive it. By, uh, at the recent address, postal fax, or email address, but not members. And there's a note at the end, you can all look at it, and I explain why I, I believe that all notices have to be posted. I know in reality it's just not possible, um, or it's just ridiculously expensive, let's put it that way. Uh, but I do believe that in terms of the act that it has to be posted, uh, obviously um, if you've got a special or unanimous resolution, it has to be sent registered post. Unfortunately, that's what the act says. The reality is a joke because we get more back than we sent out. Honestly, they grow, they multiply at the post office. They sit there to be delivered. They don't get delivered. Nobody, well, they get delivered to the post office. Nobody collects them from the post office. And then the whole lot comes back plus. It's an extreme waste of money. When you've got your biggest schemes, it costs 30 or 40,000 Rand to get those documents out. It's a sad state of affairs, but it is what it is. So failure to give proper notice to a person uh, does not invalidate the, the vote taken as long as a reasonable attempt was made. Uh, voting at a general meeting can pr just proceed despite a lack of notice as required if all people have wavered their right to notice in writing. Again, that's in my opinion, an impossibility. So we are stuck with what the act tells us we have to do. Um, voting at trustees meetings, Okay, a, a, a vote doesn't have to be um, seconded anymore. It is adopted by majority of the trustees present. Each trustee is entitled to one vote. If the votes of the trustees, including the vote of the chairman, if it becomes a tie, then the chairman has a casting vote, unless there are only two trustees. Um, a, a trustee may not vote if any proposed or current contract or dispute is, is a party to that, then you may not vote. And any matter in which the trustee has a direct or indirect personal interest, he may not vote. So if his wife is the owner of the company that's being voted about, he must leave. He must literally leave the room. Um, trustees adopt decisions by a majority vote. As I've said, they can either vote at the meeting or by what we call round robin. Okay? Uh, that's when you send out the resolution, you ask them to sign it, and you wait 21,000 days for it to come back to you. What is a deliberative uh, vote versus a casting vote? So each trustee has one vote. That is their deliberative vote. It's the vote that they have. The chairman has a, a deliberative vote and a casting vote. So if the trustees reach a tie um, for or against the resolution, whatever it is, then the chairman can vote, basically votes again, and that will give you your thing. So at the bottom, I said there, so the chairman and one trustee, they vote yes. So you've got two. Then the other two, vote no. So you've got four people and you've got a tie. Then the, the chairman vote does his casting vote and you've got three, you've got your majority, it goes. So that is that is what that means. And um, it can be done whether it's by round robin or at a meeting. Okay. And yeah, there's also, there it is, it, it may not be present or play any part, a trustee who has a direct or indirect uh, personal interest. It is very clearly laid out in the in the act. And at the end, I've given you a whole lot of other information on that matter of fiduciary duty. It's in the in the rules. It's in and in the CSOS regulation. It's it's very clearly laid out. There, there can't be confusion as to how you should perform as a trustee. Well, there shouldn't be. If you can read, you can perform properly as a trustee. Um, voting and representatives at uh, general meetings. So again, a, a motion at a general meeting does not need to be seconded anymore. And I keep getting, who was second? Who was second? No, it's not required anymore. Um, so except for a special or unanimous resolution, it must be adopted by the resolution of the majority of votes calculated in value. You cannot do it by hand or by number or put your hand up because you do not know what that hand actually, what its value is in PQ. That is how, and it's in the present and voting. 
Um, so it's, it's, except for special or unanimous resolution, that's when a, a, a special or unanimous resolution, a member can vote irrespective of whether it's in debt or got a judgment or whatever. So don't even worry about that. For an ordinary resolution, they may not, but they've also made it a lot more difficult. Uh, it's got to have an, a, a court or adjudicator has given a judgment order against that member for failing to pay his levies or an order to, to, for breach of the rules. So uh, that's very seldom that you actually have that. So generally speaking, most people are allowed to vote, irrespective that they owe the body corporate 200,000 rand. Sadly, <laughs> for the purpose of the vote, the values of the vote of any sections registered to the body corporate are considered at, at abstentation. So you cannot vote on that to just take it off. It's not, it doesn't count. Um, where a member is a trustee for a beneficiary, that member exercises the votes to exclusion of the people that are the beneficiary interested. So in other words, when you have a, a deceased estate, then the executor is voting for that, for that member. Um, or if you have a, a, a insolvent estate or whatever, then they, the, the, person, the trustee or whatever they are is voting for that member. So that, 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 that's what that one is about. Um, when two or more people are entitled to exercise a vote uh, jointly, only one of them must actually put up their hand. And I have literally had AGMs where husband and wife have to vote and they can't agree. And the entire room knows that they can't agree. And there you wait, like a job. So it's quite interesting. Um, and also remember, if said husband and wife gives a proxy to somebody, they both have to sign the proxy form giving the proxy. So if there's a joint, if they vote jointly, one vote, they and if they give a proxy, they all have to sign the proxy. Whether there's three people or four people, whoever they are, they have to jointly sign that proxy. Again, the outcome of the vote, numbers for and against, must be recorded in the minutes and announced. Thank you, meeting pal. <laughs> <laughs> what a business uh obviously this is again uh, are we running out of time uh zelinda you've got 10 minutes oh okay um and, and no more questions or anything yeah we do have a couple of questions you want to take a, a question very quickly um there's a question from melinda she says can we have a sgm to amend the 10-year maintenance plan approved at the agm and introduce a maintenance levy do you want to answer that or do you want me to answer that that's quite an interesting one. Yeah, go for it. So interestingly, Melinda, the um, Sectional Title Schemes Management Act doesn't say that a maintenance, repair and replacement plan has to be approved at an annual general meeting. It speaks about a general meeting. So it is possible okay. to approve a maintenance, repair and replacement plan amended at a special general meeting. But just remember that the maintenance, repair and replacement plan dictates what needs to be in the reserve fund. The reserve fund gets approved as part of the budget so, and the budget gets done at the annual general meeting. So it's kind of the putting the cart before the horse or, or whatever the saying is, if you don't do it at an annual general meeting, but it is quite possible. And Ruth, I'm sure that you still experience it as well, that somebody corporates um, almost six years down the line still don't have maintenance, repair and replacement plans prepared. Um, I know Peter Axman in your guys' offices being a, an engineer in his past life uh, does all of those things for his body corporates. But if you are not fortunate enough to have a portfolio manager that is able to do that or a trustee that is able to do that or even a member that is able to do that, there are companies that offer those services. I mean, Murph and THC come to mind. Um, you know, there is a fee associated with it, of course, but I don't think that there's such a thing as a template maintenance repair and replacement plan. I don't know. I could be wrong, but uh, <laughs> not, not, in, not in my skill set. The other question um, that we've got is, um, and I think this is also a nice one, are minutes permitted to be distributed to persons or third parties outside of the body corporate without notification to authorization by the body corporate and scheme executives? I don't believe so. Um, the famous one is when the, manage, uh, the uh, sales agent has now got the flat and they want all this information. I'm like, sorry, you get the owner to request it and they must send it out. Um, it's not for us to hand out. I don't believe we, we may hand out um, information willy-nilly, no. The, on an interesting note, Paul Davies, who we know um, on our social media platforms is the sales and rental expert, uh, Poppy as well, uh, and PPA, Paul, I don't think there's anything that you don't that you don't um, work with, 
But uh, Paul made a good point, and it's something that you noted, Ruth, sales and rental agents require copies of the AGM and meetings if relevant to a sale, and they constitute third parties. So yes, I mean, for that purpose, for a lawful purpose, as per Poppy, you most certainly are able as a as the as the current owner to share that information. But if the estate agent or rental agent contacts the managing agent or the body corporate, they've got no obligation to provide that information. I remember working at um, Pam Golding, the estate agents used to be very cross that we weren't sharing that information, but as property managers, we weren't entitled to. It had to come from the current owner as the seller and a very good idea to look at the minutes of the last annual general meeting. Um, I always first look at when the meeting started and when the meeting ended, because the quicker, the less problems, the longer, oh my gosh, don't bind that scheme, there's clearly problems. Yes, yeah. And then, of course, <laughs> the financial repercussions and all those fun things and the audited financial statements and the budget, if you even know how to um, how to read that uh, that budgets. I think there was one more question. Um, uh, yes, one from Derek. Um, Electronic meetings via Zoom or Teams have become the norm and, and do something that you mentioned, Ruth. However, how does one overcome prescribed management rule 15.4? And he has found many cases where attendees were not entitled to attend. And in terms of PMO 17.10c, the chairman was not in a position to be able to confirm that. And I think you spoke about that at the beginning. And I know Derek joined us a little bit late um, when you are struggling to identify um, the, the, the user on the Zoom platform when they call old Huawei or Apple, whatever, iPhone, whatever it is, uh, the identification thing. You know, I, I personally don't like being on a remote meeting when everybody's on mute and everybody's got their cameras off because how the heck do you know not only who that person is, but if that person's even there, they could be having their yeah. dinner in the background or watching their series or whatever it might be. And we often find that at the end of a meeting, people don't necessarily log off. And that's probably because they're not even behind their computers. Um, and that is a forum, you know, if people had to get up and walk out of a, a physical meeting that would affect quorum. So how would it be any different when it comes to remote meetings? So that's definitely something to take a look at. Ruth, back to you. <laughs> but that's why you've got meeting power so you can manage it because you can see who's voting and not voting and it is a it is a real concern because you say hello x and x doesn't say a word but uh, like, like i say you definitely park those that you don't you can't identify them you can't identify them they can't be there finish and clock park them don't knock them off as i said park them in the writing room <laughs> until you've identified them because you're not that ain't able to come back and that's because of zooms or security before we get into trouble but from anyone that says we're punting meeting pal too hard, uh, there are other platforms as well, very, very good platforms, equally as good and sometimes the same, sometimes different. Uh, we work uh, very well with uh, Gary Engelbrecht from BCM Track and then the Fonomadifer uh, brothers and colleagues at uh, We Connect You. Uh, not my brothers, I'm a Fonomadifer, but not related, unfortunately, to such a successful business, but uh, We Connect You as well is a fantastic platform. So there are, there are most certainly various options for people to use and if you're wanting to design your own I know uh, Nicole's cousin that's a that's a managing agent is very tech savvy and is able to design these types of things as well so there are other platforms out there we just yeah. uh, we we are a little bit technologically challenged so we like the ones that are super super easy for us to use um, and have had the most experience with sorry for that interruption Ruth no worries <laughs> so then um continue with the general meetings so the order of business at general meeting, obviously you have to confirm the proxies, the nominees, and any uh, and other persons representing members. Um, you have to issue the voting cards, which is which is where your platform comes in, whatever it is, meeting pal or connect you or whatever. Um, so that's not how you issue your voting cards. You don't run around with those little bits of paper that you have to hopefully collect at the end of the meeting. Half of them don't come back. Um, you have to determine that there is a quorum, obviously, with the, and if your meeting is no longer corporate, you literally have to close the meeting. Um, and, and yes, people do wander off on the Zoom, but by, but with your, your, your voting app will, will alert you to what's going on. So um, it is a challenge, um, and that's why I always snip the participant uh, thing on the Zoom so that I can keep track of who's on board. And then you have to elect a person to chair the meeting if necessary. So if the chairman is present, he chairs the meeting. Um, someone like myself, I will facilitate the meeting because I've got the big mouth. That does not mean I'm the chairman. I don't have a vote. I have opinions, sorry for them, but that's it. I facilitate. The chairman is present, 
That's it. You don't have to elect a chairman. He said the meeting goes ahead. If the chairman hasn't arrived after half an hour, then you have to elect a chairman. And if they have a, some professional that they want to use uh, to chair that meeting, then you have to elect them. They can't walk in the door and say, I'm here to chair the meeting. Um, you have to present the, to the meeting proof of notice of the meeting or waiver of notice. Now, that one I love. I have absolutely no idea what said proof is supposed to be. So I just say, well, you're here and you've got the notice. If anyone's got a better answer to that, please let me know, because I have no idea what they want. Um, approve the agenda. Again, a bit of an odd one. The agenda is generally what it is. Um, it's sent out. It's in terms of the act. So we vote on that. So it's a good test run to make sure everyone knows how the system, whatever pl platform you're using works. So agenda item it, that is approve the agenda. Everybody then tests the waters and hopefully you get it right and then it's fine. Uh, approve the minutes from the previous meeting, if uh, uh, general meeting, if any. Well, obviously, they always will be for an AGM. If there's a special uh, general meeting, then those if you've had a special general meeting, then you should include those as well to get them approved. Um, deal with any uh, unfinished business, if any. Well, on a general meeting, I sincerely hope, on AGM, I sincerely hope there is no unfinished business by the time you get to the next AGM. Um, if the meeting is an annual general meeting, then obviously there's more criteria on your agenda. Um, you have to receive the reports and activities of, and decisions of the trustees since the previous general meeting, including reports of committees. It's not the poor old chairman that has to write a chairman's report. It's actually a combined effort from all the trustees. Um, if anyone's got trustees who understand that, I'd love to know because we they are very few and far between. It's always the chairman and who they found you the day before and says, please draft me my, my, my report. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to approve your schedules of insurance replacement values. Uh, with or without amendment. And at this stage in the meeting, you always just remind people that if they've in, insured their, oh, sorry, if they've added or improved their particular unit to some amazing degree that they've got marble cladding and gold taps and crystal chandeliers or whatever they may have done, they might need to in, increase the insured value of their unit. And then obviously the managing agent can arrange that. Um, the, then you've got to obviously have the on the agenda the determined extent of insurance covered by the body corporate in, in terms of rules 23, 6, 7, and 8. Uh, so 23, 6, the one is for um, the, the liability, the slip and fall, which is the minimum of 10 million. The other one is your fidelity cover, which there's a formula for, which you all um, sure know. And then number eight is actually requires a special resolution. So should you have some insurance cover to discuss um, for 20, under, the falls under 23.8, you actually have to have a 30 day notice. It's a special resolution. Yes, um, we, we, we've, sorry to interrupt you. We've actually run out of time. It's 11 o'clock on the dot and I know everybody is incredibly busy. We try to keep the webinars on time. We've got so many questions and I see that you, I think you still have quite a, quite a bit left. Um, so we're definitely going to, we actually have one or two people still joining us. <laughs> We're going to allow anybody that needs to hop off to hop off. Um, and then with your indulgence, uh, can we maybe go for another five or 10 minutes and then we'll officially close the meeting? I don't know if there's anything specific left on your notes that you want to deal with uh, specifically. Um, perhaps when you're preparing for next month's webinar, and for those of you that don't know, Ruth is going to be joining us along with Liche, that's actually online, uh, to be interviewed by our very own Nicole Nell on what it's all about to be portfolio managers and studying towards and or have studied towards their legal degrees and any other <laughs> qualifications. Obviously, it is Women's Month, so we have chosen two very strong women in our industry um, that have had quite a, quite a lot of odds stacked against them in their studies and in their careers and have come out on the other side shining. Ruth, you got a compliment on the group earlier. Uh, somebody in your industry said, I think that lady is very impressive. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, which was pretty cool. You are very impressive. So oh, I'm going to give you another five or so minutes and you can pinpoint what you would like to chat about still. And then we can take one or two live questions and then we'll call it today. But for anybody that needs to hop off, thank you so much for joining us. We won't hold it against you and the session will be made available for anybody that doesn't want to miss out on the last couple of minutes. Ruth, back to you. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so on the agenda, now these are, as I say, this is in terms of PMR 17.6. So uh, approve the budgets for the administrative and reserve funds for the next financial year. So um, yeah, interesting that you, if you're wanting a special general meeting, but I think if something has changed and you have to have said special general meeting to change something, I 
So I certainly don't see why you shouldn't, uh, in my opinion, as I say, lots of them. Um, it's interesting, it says, for the next financial year, because remember, your reserve budget is actually for 10 years. Uh, and, and that's quite vital to have it for 10 years, because you need to see the, the ins and outs. How is it actually going to resolve? Because if you look at it for next year, oh, you might have enough money for next year, but have you got enough money for the year three when you're going to be repainting the building? And I think people need to realize that. Um, and I don't often get people that do notice that, but that be that as it may. And not everybody has these things, but it's certainly becoming better and better and better. And also as we learn how to prepare it, it gets better and better. Uh, rule of thumb in my book, you don't put anything on that reserve fund budget that is under 50,000 Rand. No, that is a maintenance fund. It's for the admin fund. It's for maintenance. It's as simple as that. Um, so this is still a, a learning curve for a lot of people and a lot of schemes just didn't have the financial resources. So we're getting there, we're better than we were five years ago. <laughs> um, consider the annual financial statements. They are considered by the members and not approved. They should already have been signed off by the trustees. Appointment of an auditor to audit the financial, uh, the financial statements. That's when you appoint your auditor. And no, it's not for the trustees to decide, much as they'd like to, the members decide. If you think you're gonna have a debate, Go to the meeting with three or four quotes, present them, and let people speak. There's nothing in the act that says you have to change auditors every so often. It may be good practice. It may not. Depends on your scheme. Uh, our audits are, are not expensive, so um, but it has to be done. Then determine the number of trustees to be elected to serve during the next financial year. Uh, that always is a bit of a hot potato because I, you know, if you have five nominees and five people. Uh, for the scheme is sufficient, then suggest that they vote for five, then those five nomination nominees just stand automatically. Um, yeah, it's, it's I, I, again, I believe less is more. So the, the fewer trustees, uh, the better, depending on the size of the scheme, obviously. Um, but yeah, I, try, I always try and sort of box it somehow that we don't have a chamos of voting and then people nominating from the floor and then you've got to vote it down. So try and get your nominations in an advance and then try and balance the number. But again, it's not your core, you can only suggest. And then obviously you've got to elect the trustees, report on the lodgement of any amendments. Well, that can take two years to come back to you, but you can report that they were lodged. Deal with any new or further business. Uh, I know a lot of trustees don't like this line, but it is there and members are entitled to have their say. Um, so that if anybody puts up their hand to deal with, you know, to ask questions and discuss something, they are entitled to do that. I don't, do not believe that you can shut people off. Um, give directions or impose restrictions uh, on the trustees. That is, that is when you will give your instructions or the members will give the instructions uh, uh, to the trustees. One of them might be that they can't spend more than 100,000 on an unbudgeted item without advising all the members. I always say if you're going to do things like that, then it must be advised. If you're going to say without calling a special meeting or something, you are not going to get things done. If that roof falls in or the lift collapses and you've got to spend 100,000, now you've got to call a meeting before you can do that, not prudent. I would say without advising the owners. Then if owners want to then shout and scream and find out why, then you have your meeting or your discussion, but they need to fix the lift or to fix the roof. Or whatever it's obviously they can't spend on an improvement because that'll be contrary to the act and they've got to stand stay within the act um and then dissolve the meeting and if you remember you put the time when it goes i'm not always very good at remembering that because <laughs> then i roll straight into the trustee meeting and i'm so busy saying trustees don't go trustees go go you got to stay for the meeting <laughs> the timing is good um then obviously subject to the above, uh, the trustees determine the agenda for an annual or special meeting, provided that it must contain all the business. So if they want to add something to it, that's fine. They must add a description and, and a description of the matters that will be voted and propose wording of any special or unanimous resolution. Please give them guidance on that. Uh, we ended up at a, an AGM that I attended, uh, wasn't one of mine, and they didn't get a result because the wording was so bad, it was, it was, it didn't happen. And it was sad because I think they would have got an, a positive result if they'd had it worded correctly. Very important. And then I just added for fun, just so you know, because to me it's important, the fiduciary uh, position of trustees, it's very clear, it's noted in the Act. I've just put it there as verbatim from the act just for your information, but it's the same old, same old, good faith, honesty, um, exercise the powers in terms of the act, act without exceeding those powers, uh, avoid material conflict, they can't receive any uh, personal benefit, uh, notify the trustees if there is a direct or indirect material interest, 
Um, yeah, so it, it's really, really vital. And, and as I say, your trustees need to be aware of this. That's section eight of the act. And then the CSOS Act regulation 14, again, um, this has some really interesting stuff. Inform and educate yourselves if you go to trustee, take reasonable steps to uh, uh, obtain sufficient information and advice. Um, they must be excused from meetings if they're not going to attend, otherwise they must attend meetings. Um, they must have an active and independent opinion, not just because it suits me, it's the good of the scheme. They must exercise due dil uh, diligence. Um, I want to interrupt you there for a second, Ruth. That one's very important. I was actually at a meeting uh, the night before last, and Nicole now continued with the meeting last night, where um, a trustee raised this unless excused by the chairperson of the scheme executives on reasonable grounds about one of their fellow trustees. And they said that the trustees, that the trustee didn't attend any of the monthly meetings when the trustee was overseas, even though the meetings happened remotely. And then apparently um, the, the trustee wasn't attending a couple more. And the, the, the chairperson had gotten a, a WhatsApp from the person and uh, the one trustee wanted to know what the excuse was. They wanted the WhatsApp to be shared with the remainder of the trustees. And I thought, you know, that's actually, that's right. Um, and the excuse was, um, I don't know, sometimes you can say it's reasonable, sometimes you can say it's not, but we all know that there are trustees out there, unfortunately, that, you know, have a lot going on in their lives, and, and sometimes they can't attend a meeting for a reasonable reason, other times it's like, oh, you know what, I actually don't feel like dealing with these people, I'm not going to go to the meeting tonight, or, oh, what is my vote count, it's going to happen anyway if I'm there or not, or whatever it might be, and then we often get the thing of, oh, no, they've given their proxy to one of the other trustees to take their decision. <laughs> So yeah, that was very interesting. People should definitely yeah. know this clause. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing how many proxies still think, how many proxies, how many trustees still think they can give proxies to each other. Um, you know, and you've got people that are traveling and can't then get an, uh, an alternate, that other trustees can vote in an alternate trustee. So then you yeah. can have your, your full meeting because it becomes really difficult that people don't attend. I mean, I'm sure everyone's fully aware of that. Um, yeah, so then just know the obligations of the community scheme executive in terms of the above points are in addition to and do not derogate from the fiduciary obligation of scheme executive in terms of common law or any applicable statute. So, so it's really, trustees must understand, it's, it's, it's yes, it's they're unpaid slaves, but they really do have to act in as, uh, as, as per their duties and they're very clearly outlined. Um, and, and that's just the facts of life, sadly. You're dealing with other people's money, with your investments, whatever it is, you've really got to behave accordingly. Um, and then that's just my point as to why I believe that it should be posted, uh, because the exemptions are for um, only refers to notice will be special or unanimous resolutions are taken. I think so you can write an article for us. We're not going to argue that, we know. And then I uh, just uh, uh, um, we don't need to go through it. You can read it at your, uh, at your leisure. This is just if the meeting is a first general meeting. It's just uh, information because it's slightly different to your um, ordinary meetings. It's, it's also prescribed in terms of the act. Everything is listed what you need. And for, uh, for purposes of voting on the items in point seven, obviously then the developer can't vote. So he's allowed to vote everything out, but he doesn't count as a quorum. So it's quite an interesting conundrum. This uh, issue about the developer meetings, I think we need to hold in abeyance because while we were on the webinar um, on that on our sectional title living in South Africa Facebook group, we had a request from one of our members to actually hold the webinar to deal with the handover of the body corporate from the developer to the members. Okay. Um, yeah. especially for new owners in sectional title that don't understand the process. And I think we'll definitely bring you on for that, um, along with a couple of other guest speakers, um, because it is it's very important for, for members to understand what that first general meeting is all about, what to expect. Um, otherwise, that relationship with the developers most certainly going to run south. So I think we'll leave it at that. Ruth, okay. thank you so much for your presentation. I know that we rushed through the end. Um, and I kept you very busy with comments and questions, but I know that you wanted it to be um, interactive. Um, thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gents, thank you so much for your time. I see quite a few of you have dropped off and we're going to um, make sure that we will um, deal with any of your questions and things like that, um, uh, obviously as part of the recording and then as part of the presentation that we'll have on our website as well. Um, for those of you that would like to uh, stay on and have a chat with us for another three minutes or so, you're more than welcome to unmute yourself and raise your questions or raise your comments. 
Uh, but from our side, officially, we're going to say thank you very much to Ruth. And we are going to um, end the recording there. Uh,